This morning I'll be reading from Matthew 25, from verse 1. I'll give you a minute to find that. So Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came, also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. And he, but he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he, and he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, here, here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew what I, that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me, I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when do we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, 
Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked, or sick or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Thanks, um, Brett and Josh. Good morning. Uh, good to see you all uh, this morning, uh, if you're here, and also for those of you who are joining us online. Um, if you're visiting, welcome. It's a great privilege to have you here with us this morning. My name is Shabu. I have the joy of being one of the pastors here at Canterbury. Um, we as a church uh, at times like to, well, at times in general, overall, we like to take our time through the books of the Bible. And we're in the Gospel of Matthew at the moment, and we're coming towards the tail end of this Gospel. And so this means things that, if you haven't already picked it up, it's already heated up quite a bit from last week, and now you've heard language already, Jesus has been quite upfront and quite direct and quite confronting. And last week we were challenged to consider a few things, and particularly we were asked to gaze at the beauty and the wonder of who Jesus is as the Son of Man. We were invited to come and find safety and sanctuary in Him, And we were reminded that he is indeed king, which we hopefully, as you've been going through Matthew, you've been hearing over and over again, this declaration of who he is the king, and that he is uh, ushering in this reality of this wonderful new kingdom, and also the kingdom that is to come, as some people call it, the now and not yet. We were invited to be challenged and consider, well, if that is true, you can't just carry on life as normal. And so this morning, we're really seeing part two of what Jesus was already teaching, and now we're seeing part two of that in the chapter that was just read to you. This morning, uh, friends, I've got two questions for you and for me. And the question is, or the questions, one, are you ready for the return of Jesus Christ? Are you ready for the return of Jesus Christ? And the second one is, If that is true, how does that shape how we live today? If that is true, how does that shape how we live today? Would you join with me in prayer? Uh, Great Shepherd, Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning, and you already see the hearts of everyone this morning. You already know the kind of week that we've had, perhaps even this morning, as we've rushed into coming to the service. as you've been already speaking to us through the songs, the wonderful communion focus, even showing your faithfulness and the way that you provide for us to do mission and ministry. We come before you now, and we pray that you will continue to speak to us through your word. Holy Spirit, help us today to hear. In Jesus' name. And God's people said. Uh, One of the great joys and privileges of serving at Canterbury Gardens, uh, for those of us who are in pastoral team, is that we get to do weddings. Uh, And it's a lot of fun. Well, I think it's fun. Probably not the couple who who I have to walk alongside. But it is fun for me because there's great excitement. There's great joy for that moment, that day, for the wedding day, because it's all about the focus for them. At least it is the wedding day. Uh, And now, in our Western context, particularly in our Western culture, when we talk about the wedding day, I have a question for you. Who is the main focus on the wedding day? The bride. bride. Someone someone said something else, but we'll go bride. That's a good answer. Someone yelled out very passionately, it's the bride. Right? In our Western context, it is the bride, right? It's this beautiful moment where she arrives and everyone's been waiting. You look at her dress. Uh, the, the ladies in general are looking at the groom. Is he going to be weeping and sobbing as she walks down the aisle? It's beautiful. 
Uh, they're looking at the bridesmaids' dresses, the flowers. Sorry, guys, you lose out. You just got to wear a suit and just show up, apparently. No, that's not true. It's much more than that. But it is a beautiful, wonderful scene, isn't it? It is. It's a lot of celebration. Uh, Jesus is speaking of a wedding. And in that time, in that culture, weddings are not like what we know of. It was, it was amazing and beautiful and powerful. But the whole process, both the engagement and the wedding day, wasn't just a day. Actually, the engagement was a whole process. It had significant uh, weight to it. And you saw that in Jesus' life too. Do you remember? Right? Joseph, he wanted to quietly put her, put her away. So what that meant was, even for that engagement to break, they all actually had to have almost like a divorce certificate to say, you can do that. Even the wedding itself was more than just the day. There was this whole preparation and waiting that was going on in the background. So here in this moment, in this history, this moment, this time for a culture that when they hear what Jesus speaks of, they already know what Jesus is saying. What was the practice at the time? Uh, we would call them bridesmaids. That is the language that Jesus uses, virgins. There's ten of them. They are gone to send out to get the groom, to prepare and to, to gather and to take to the feast. And as they head out, uh, you can read about this. As historians talk about this ceremony, there was a great procession. That's why you've got the lamps and so on, because it would sometimes go to night time. There was great celebration as people prepared. And sometimes it would even go for a week you can read about this, if you wish. There's a lot of histor historical books about it. There are actually uh, extra historical books outside of the Bible um, that write about these particular practices. There are probably people even here in our church who are experts at this particular thing. But I want you to remember for a moment, right? Jesus has just said, no one knows the hour of the day of his return. That's who he's talking about, ultimately him. And this is particularly aimed at the disciples and followers and people who will now go forth with this message of the kingdom just after he, he is risen from, the, from uh, death. And so the early church, perhaps even listening to this, as the Gospel of Matthew is read out to them, they've been challenged to ponder something, though. You don't know the hour of his return, but please don't be caught out. Please don't be caught out when he returns. Be prepared. And in this context here, the language firstly of the bridegroom is speaking of Christ. So we've got two groups in this parable. You have, firstly, the bridesmaids or the virgins, that one is the group who are wise, the other is foolish. But both are ready to go and meet the bridegroom. You see that in verse 2, but as they approach this particular moment, they approach it in two different ways. The foolish ones are not prepared. That's what Jesus is saying. They're not prepared. There's no oil in the lamp. They're just going. The wise are prepared. There's flasks of oil. Because they know, or perhaps they know, this could take a while. What's the focus here? Jesus is causing them to consider who's prepared for the return of the bridegroom. It's clear both the foolish and the wise, they go out to do what's required of them in that culture at that time, but it's taken a while for the bridegroom to come. There's no language what, but the language is very clear. He's been delayed. And they both are drowsy. And some say this language of them getting drowsy, it's like they're doing work and it's getting tiring. But only five are prepared for his unexpected return. And there's a shout. I mean, the language that Matthew's using is language that are familiar. It's like a sudden shout of a bridegroom returning. Everyone get ready. He's here. And both are awake. But only five are prepared for his return. The foolish uh, ones also ask, well, we don't have any oil. Can you guys help us out? They say, well, if we give it to you, well, we can't have enough for ourselves. This long-awaited celebration is about to happen. So they're told to go to the markets in the middle of midnight, and they head off. But there's this contrast very clearly shown to us. There's no mention at all that the bridegroom comes, and they say, oh, look, there's another five who've gone to the market. We probably should wait for them. No waiting. The bridegroom comes, and they follow, and instantly they head towards the feast. You see that in verse 10? The bridegroom comes... Those who are ready 
are heading to the feast. The foolish are not ready, and they come back and they hear the celebration, but the door is shut to them. They can't come in. And they knock on the door, some say, but it's like this language of, Lord, Lord, and they're saying, can you open? And they hear his devastating news. There's no sort of, oh, you're not invited to the wedding, but it clearly says, I do not know you. I do not know you. Both are invited, but only five are ready. Only five are known to the bridegroom. Friends, it's a warning to say that, yes, there may be many signs that you can look for, there may be many things going on, but you don't know the hour. But are you ready? Will you stay alert for His return? What that's saying is, will your life be shaped by the truth the bridegroom will come? Do you know this? And what He's speaking of, ultimately, we know this because we have the whole Bible, He's speaking ultimately of Himself, Jesus, that He will return. It's a reminder for those who are Christians at the time, even for us, will you be prepared? Are you ready? The language is, are you going to be on alert? Because if you truly believe, if I truly believe that Jesus will return one day, it should shape everything of our lives, every area of our lives, including how we steward our time, steward everything. It will shape everything because we're preparing for His return. And even if that takes a long time, and it might, Jesus continues to use this language of parables that he has already been doing through the Gospel of Matthew and other Gospels to show again what it means to be his people, kingdom people living for him, because they're shaped by this truth and how they live in this world, shaped by the truth that the master will return, the bridegroom will come one day. Then he goes now to illustrate it further to talk about a master who heads on a journey. Once again, the language in those verses in front of you, we don't know the details, but he's gone off on a long journey. We're not told about the time. But notice what it says in verse 14 of chapter 25. To these servants, he entrusts something to them. He gives a portion of his property But note the language again, according to their ability. That's how much he gives them. He determines what he gives. He determines and knows his servants, so entrust them accordingly. And so the master, and we know because what Jesus is doing, he's actually ultimately talking about himself. He entrusts, he makes a call, he bases it on their ability that he knows as the master, and he gives it to them. So each of them have a responsibility. Each of them have been given something. But their focus is knowing that as servants of the great master, they're committed to serving him because they know what they've been entrusted belongs ultimately to him and that they will give an account. They will give an account. Now, the language of talents in the passage in front of you, that when we hear the word talents, and you might already know this, but when we hear the talents, it's not something to do about how good you are at gardening or, you know, you're really good at making sourdough, which is wonderful. Good on you if you've got those talents. What it's specifically talking about in this context particularly, and actually literally is to say talents, it's like the weight that they use to weigh money. There's a lot of writing on this if you want to go down that track, but at the heart of it is to say there's a lot a lot of money. There's great weight to it, and it's been entrusted to them according to their abilities, and they're expected to return something. So the master is gone, and so some of them get straight to work. And their motivation is not selfish, because if it was selfish, it would be a total different story here, at least for the faithful ones, because they know they've been entrusted something from the master of great value, And they also know that they're accountable ultimately to the master because it belongs to the master. It's his, always has been. Just like the foolish bridesmaids, though, there's a servant who decides to go and hide this money that he's been entrusted with. He's actually, the language is, he's actually afraid. And so in verse 18, the master again returns, the language again, after a long time. In other words, we don't know when he's going to return. He'll just return after a long time. 
The report is given. Seven, one. Five talents multiplied, five more. And what is the master's response? Well done, good and faithful servant. Faithful over a little, set you over much, enter the joy of your master. Second seven, two talents multiplied, two more. Master's response, well done, good and faithful servant. Over a little, I've set you over, set over a little, I've set you over much, enter the joy of your master. Do you hear the language? Do you hear the, the praise? Do you hear the approval that they're given? They both were given different values in some sense, but they both had the same response from the master. See, Jesus is challenging that if you're going to be a follower in his kingdom, as his kingdom workers, the master is going to go. And that's what he's talking about in his disciples. He's going to be gone. But in the meantime, that they've been entrusted with something of great value. And that means they are now to work according for his pleasure and for his purpose, but they will give an account one day, as we all will. And, they, and what you notice is that they're they so moved that they, they respond, they live their life knowing that they are entrusted with something to their master. Their work or their focus is that they've been stewed and been given this to them. It's not ultimately based on themselves, rather based on who they serve, their master, for his pleasure and pleasing. Jesus uses words that ultimately would become such strong words for the disciples going forward to hear what the Master says. It's very familiar words for a disciple of Jesus. The language of being good. This is who they are because they've been faithful to their call, to whom they're serving, and how are they to serve? As servants to their ultimate Master. So the question for us is, what kind of servant will we be with what God has entrusted us with, what Christ has entrusted us with? Something that is of great value. Because if we know that we've been entrusted with this, it shapes every area of our life. See, the gospel is the good news, but along with the gospel comes how a reshaping of everything in our lives, in in every area of our lives, that means we see this as a resource given by a master for his kingdom purpose, for his glory. It's been entrusted to us if you're a follower of Jesus. The other contrast is the other servant who also comes and reports and it's interesting, it's such striking kind of remark. He describes the master how, you see that in verse 24? You are a hard man. And what's going on underneath this is, is I think this servant is afraid of this master. He actually uses language, well, actually, you get things without even trying. I mean, you sow and you get things back. You, you, you do this work and it, it's going to come back to you anyway. It's already yours, but I'm afraid of you. You already have a lot. It's like saying the servant turns around to this master and says, hey, I'm so afraid of you. Anyway, it's all yours. So what I've done is I've taken what you've given me, I've put it into a shoebox, and I've hid it under my bed till you return. So take it. It's yours. And the master's response through Jesus is this. There's a failure. It's it's really confronting. You wicked, slothful servant. You lazy servant. The master says, if you know what I can do, then the very least you could have done, if you already know what I can do, the very least is you can invest this money. This money that's actually already mine, perhaps even to the bank that I already own, so that at least it can earn some interest. My own money, then you can give back to me. The point is, if you don't want to do any work, at least the money could have done some work if you want to lift up your finger to work. So the sermon is stripped cast out, the one with ten is rewarded, while the other faces judgment. See, what's going on here, it's confronting, and particularly you've got to remember the the disciples perhaps are listening to this teaching, and others are also listening. It is a call to wake up, to pay attention. It is judgment right there in front of them. 
because they do not see the great value of what has been entrusted to them. And particularly in the context of Matthew, the religious leaders had totally lost sight of what has been entrusted to them because they continually refuse to ultimately use it. Because their view of who God is, the Master, is a view that He is cruel rather than He is generous, the one who has entrusted them. In other words, their lives are not shaped by the fact what has been entrusted to them. It's not their own. It's actually ultimately on loan to them for the purpose of expanding the Master's kingdom. And it's a reminder that there is work to do. See, Jesus is challenging the thinking of the time that as their disciples going forward, that you will be entrusted with the things of the kingdom. But what rather than a talent or money, which is there, but it's much greater value, it is to be shown, it is to be shared, and this very truth now shapes how you live. It shapes all aspects of your life. In our church, you may hear language such as this. We often say um, the language, we, are, we desire to be a Christ-centered church. We desire to be a gospel-centered church. It's a very trendy thing these days. At the heart of it, what we're trying to explain and say is that if the truth and the wonder and majesty of who Jesus is, is true... It reshapes every area of your life. So on a weekly basis, even the very reality that you've been placed in a particular place and space is for the kingdom and his purpose. The very resources that you've been given, whether you save, whether you invest, whether you pay, whether, whatever you do with it, it's all from a purpose that is for his purpose and for his glory. Because it's been entrusted to you, it belongs to the master. And this is why as Christians, and maybe this is where at times where we we try to divide it, right, in our Christian world. Here is my church thing. This is the only time that's really holy. But during Monday to Saturday, eh, optional. Now, I know many of you are not trying to live those lives, but sometimes we fall into that trap. The sacred and secular. The point is this, friends. It matters to God how you run your business because you represent the king. It matters how if you are just doing some work at a cafe because you're trying to just get through uni and school, it matters how you work because you represent the king. It matters in how we live our lives in the now till his return because in the way that we live, in the way that we use these resources, in the way we do all of these things, we see that as a gift entrusted to us for his purpose, for his kingdom, as a witness that we belong to the master. In all areas of our lives, in our singleness, in our marriage, in our season of widow, in our parenting, even in retirement. Now, perhaps it's because of the things that I've been liking on my social media. Uh, I've been enjoying seeing the various things in the Olympics, right? And one of the things I've been fascinated with is the various Christian athletes who've been putting it out there that they're followers of Christ. Now, in an American context, it's probably a little bit more cultural in that day some of them will do that. But this is probably the first time that I've seen some Australian athletes actually putting it out there very clearly that they're followers of Jesus. I don't know if you've seen this image of Nicola Oslag is the first one. I hope I said her name right. That's her. She's got a little journal, and she sits before she goes for a high jump. She has a bit of a debrief of what she did right and what she did wrong. On that journal, if you zoom into it, it says, for his glory. For her, high jump is much more than just high jump. Uh, It's for the shape of his glory. Uh, There's this quote that was here, you maybe have already seen this, up here on the screen, the next one. For me, it's like being in a church. My worship might not be my singing, it's in my feet, jumping over a bar. Her faith shapes her sport. Uh, When she won the silver medal, this was on her social media uh, uh, handle, it was up here on the screen, this is what she said. Praise be to God, my rock. He is my strength and song. 
Do you hear that? In this moment, for her, that high jump is a platform to use to display that she's a follower of Jesus. Now, that's on a world stage. I may train to become a high jumper one day, but your laughing tells me you've got a lot of faith in me. Thanks. That's great, guys. <laughs> it's not going to happen, I know. It's okay. I'm, I've dealt with it this week. Um, we don't all have that stage, right, like she might have. But we have been entrusted with something. We've been entrusted something with some great value that is the good news of Jesus, the gospel, this truth, this treasure. It's much more worth more than money. It's been entrusted to us. And it's been entrusted to us to proclaim and to show, not just on Sundays, not just during small group, at home, at school, at work, at uni, in retirement, in wherever it might be, it shapes everything because there is a day coming, Jesus will return and we will give an account. We will give an account. Do we live in light of this? Followers of Christ, do we see what we've been entrusted with our gifts, both the good news of the gospel and the very things that you have that are of any value that are good. Then Jesus concludes his teaching by showing again what will happen when he returns on that day in verse 21. As we've already seen, there are these contrasts going through these parables, right? There are now given to us two images, sheep and goats. For those of us who are in 2024, anyone raise sheep or goats here at the moment? No one. I was nervous to say that because I thought if someone put their hand, I'd be like, I don't know what to do with that. Anyway, Jesus is not against goats, if you're wondering. What's the point of this? What Jesus is doing is language that's very familiar for that culture. And not only that, it's language that's from the Old Testament, actually. He's using this language of sheep and goats. The sheep and goats in that culture would have grazed together, then the shepherd would separate them. Sheep were prized highly as well. But here he says something about himself, what he's saying. Do you hear that in verse 32? That he's the great shepherd. The beautiful moment, this amazing moment, is a taste of what will come. And it's a reminder to the disciples, in Matthew 28 we'll see this, is where they're sent out to proclaim this reality of who he is and the kingdom that is to come, but also the job that they have to go and tell the nations about his return and what he has done. In verse 32, we have this beautiful picture of the nations being gathered, but also a confronting picture that God's plan has always been for the nations, that they will be gathered, but all of them will come to face judgment. And you have this image of the sheep on the right side. Speaks of those who are blessed by the Father. They belong to the great shepherd. They've heard his voice and responded to his news. As the returned king, he comes to judge. But those who are the sheep are provided an inheritance into the kingdom that's been prepared for them. And do you see the language? Since the foundation of the world. This has always been God's plan. To reach out to the lost, to proclaim to the nations. It's always been His plan, not just to one group or nation. And we've been given contrast all through this, right? You've seen the wise, you've seen the foolish, you've seen the good and the faithful. Now you have this picture of those who are blessed and righteous. In other words, these are disciples who've responded to the gospel, who responded to the shepherd's voice. And now their lives have been shaped by this. How are their lives shaped by this truth? By the way that they live. How they love and serve one another. I mean, look at the way that Jesus describes it. It's beautiful. It's an amazing picture. Jesus says, When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came to me. This dialogue is the conversation that we see in front of us. And some say, well, uh, just hold on a minute. When did this happen? How did this happen? What Jesus is getting at is he's setting the standard, or rather, he's saying, if you belong to the kingdom of God, if you belong to his kingdom, this is what your lives will look like. It's just to display that, to show that you're a disciple. See, the focus is there, right? It's this language we've already heard in the Gospel of Matthew. I don't know if you picked it up. See that in verse 40? 40? King says, truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these. 
these brothers. The clue is, you did it to me. In this moment, Jesus is teaching a follower. Even the very least of the followers is not defined by their ethnic background because it's very important for the early church to know that. Can you imagine a church from all tribes and nations gathering to worship Jesus? To them, they are righteous, fellow brothers. They belong to His kingdom to live lives. And what shapes them is that their lives that are shaped so much that they don't even focus on themselves. They don't even realize what they're doing. Because they say, well, when did we do this? They don't even realize it. They're saying, ultimately, what they don't see is they're ultimately serving Jesus. So what's this showing for us is Jesus is saying that if the kingdom of God and who He is shapes everything in your life, there's going to be fruit shown in the way that you display this to the people that He's just described. Firstly, beginning by the followers of Christ and then extend it out. Another way to put it is post the resurrection, it's like saying you're going to have this um, this reaction or this um, inclination to do these things, not because of yourself, that the Spirit Himself is going to cause you, it'll be like a knee-jerk reaction. You know, I was sitting there and thinking about this, right? And, I, and this is, shows probably how my brain works. I was like, you know, imagine arriving to eternity and you're standing before Jesus, and I'm talking to Jesus, and Jesus says, how are you, Shabu? Oh, it's so great to see you, Lord. You know, um, Shabu, you know, it's good to have you here. I'm like, thank you. Um, look, I know since we, I don't know how long we've got, so maybe attorney, let me go quickly here. Have you seen my YouTube channel? Have you seen my sermons that I've preached? And Jesus goes, wow, that's really nice. Thank you for that. Um, have I introduced you to Dorothy? I said, no, no, who's Dorothy? Oh, Oh, Dorothy um, is someone who's been actually just praying for someone for many years, who's been cooking meals, who's been dropping it off. You never met Dorothy? Oh, no. I know her. Now, it's a, perhaps a silly illustration, right? But friends, what I'm trying to explain to you is that Jesus sees the things that matter. Jesus sees the things that matter. Do you know these spirit-filled, spirit-led knee-jerk reactions? You know what that means in our day and time? There won't be a need to show it on your social media that you're doing any of this. Because Christ sees. Because what they're doing ultimately, in doing so, they're serving their king. Their king who is glorious and so beautiful and so wonderful. The king who is willing to identify himself with the hungry, with the thirsty with the strangers, those who have become naked and imprisoned because of the gospel. And in contrast, just like the foolish virgins, just like the slothful servant, those on the left are cursed, facing eternal judgment because their lives were marked with an absence of not seeing the needs of the least of them before them. They're willing to live comfortable lives, not recognizing and seeing ultimately whom they're going to be serving. If they're not serving, sorry, that's King Jesus. So friends, if you're a follower of Christ, are you ready for His return? And if you do not know Jesus, and perhaps you're listening in or visiting, I want you to know that there is a God who created this world. He created this world for you to have relationship with Him. But the first humans at the time, they rejected His loving rule and reign. And in so, what we call as Christians, sin entered the world. And what sin is ultimately saying, I will be my own king of my own life. And God, as who He is, pursues rebellious, foolish, slothful people like you and me over and over again through the whole story of the Bible to ultimately show that how He will fully show that in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes into this world who perfectly lives the life that you and I should have lived. But then He goes and dies for your sin and my sin, as we've already heard in the communion focus. But because He is God, He was raised again on the third day. Then if you put your faith in Him, He will come and live in your hearts through His Holy Spirit, and then He sends you out to live for Him because He will return one day. So are you ready for His return? 
Do we live shaped by His coming kingdom in all areas of our lives, not just on Sundays? If Jesus came to work with you, does it look like that you are a follower of Jesus? Jesus came and lived in a week in your house, does it look like that you're a follower of Jesus? If Jesus sat with you as you web browse, what are the websites you're going on, does it look like that you are a follower of Jesus? Yet in this we must not forget, ultimately, the whole point in this passage is once again to graze, gaze at the glory of who Christ is. The one who is indeed the great shepherd. The one who indeed is a beautiful, glorious bridegroom who left his heavenly home to pursue us. The ones who are lost in darkness and our foolishness. The one who is indeed the righteous, just master who has all authority but became a servant in order to serve. He is the great king who is willing to go hungry, who is willing to go thirsty, who is willing to be imprisoned and beaten up and then crucified and some say even in nakedness so that all of us who put their trust in him in faith can inherit the kingdom. All, not just one people group, all the nations, for those who hear his voice, the great shepherd. Because then, if that is the thing that shapes you, it doesn't matter what happens in your life because you live for his glory. This came up in my feed again because it shows you I'm obviously looking at the Olympics a lot. Uh, it came up here on the screen. I don't know if it's up here. I don't know if you saw this Sydney McLaughlin or Lavrone, an American uh, um, hurdler. She did the world record, and this is what she said on her um, interview afterwards. Records come and go. The glory of God is eternal. I don't deserve anything, but by the grace of God, through faith, Jesus has given me everything. What a short snippet of a gospel presentation in her win. But I want to say something very clearly here. For those of you who are um, wrestling with your faith... Uh, maybe you constantly are in doubt. Oh, maybe, does Jesus really love me? Maybe I've stuffed up. Maybe, <laughs> can I encourage you to hear something? The great shepherd, Jesus Christ, who deeply loves you and understands doubts and welcomes your doubts, bring your doubts. Even the very thought of you wrestling with that is a good sign. <laughs> what Jesus is talking about are people who are apathetic and have no concern. If you're wrestling with them, my dear friend, my dear doubter, Christ hears you. Come to him. Bring your doubts. So, brothers and sisters, until then, we wait in this anticipation to live out this truth of our Savior. But it should be shaping in everything in our lives. So, a couple of questions for you to consider as we close up. Firstly, do we live in our daily life as Christ will return at any time? Or has the pull of the eastern suburbs' comfortable life <laughs> lied to us and we've fallen into a sense of slothfulness and laziness? Do you see whatever role you might have in whatever season of life you're having as people who have been entrusted with something to further his kingdom that one day we will give an account? Do you know, I want you to know the elders feel the weight of this often. As a pastoral team, we feel the weight of this. And I say this more than anything else to pray for us that we will keep on feeling that weight in order to be sure that the gospel is both proclaimed and shared. Who is the least that Jesus is calling you to feed, clothe, visit? In other words, serve as though it's Jesus himself at your home, at school, at uni, at work, in your neighborhood, with your grandkids, your parents, kids, you get my point. Followers of Christ, our bridegroom, our master, our Lord, our great shepherd will return. Until then, there is work to be done. Are we prepared? He has entrusted us with his gospel. And in everything, we have a purpose. In everything, we have worth and value. He's come to build his kingdom, and we are part of that work. And once again, if you do not know Christ, please respond to him in faith today. And maybe for some of us, we've got a little bit comfortable. We know that Christ has saved us and we're just waiting for his return. Can I encourage you that you have work to do? Jesus is not inviting you and I into, into a cruise ship. 
has invited us as rescue boats who have been sent out to join in his mission to proclaim the message of grace, to show the message of grace. Would you join with me in prayer as the music team comes up to lead us in the last song? King Jesus, our great shepherd, our great master, would you help us not to be foolish or lazy as your sheep? Help us live as ones who will listen to the shepherd's voice in whatever season of life we're in. And help us to build our lives on you, Jesus, our great solid rock. In your name we pray.